Welcome to Week 4, Nursing 203, Chapter 79, uh, Endocrine Disorders. Yes, I am aware there's a whole lot of Hello Kitty behind me, um, and uh, stuff, whatever that is. Um, borrowing my wife's office for uh, just a moment uh, while we go through this. So, endocrine. Admittedly, during nursing school, endocrine was not my favorite. Uh, as I have evolved as a nurse, uh, I have discovered that there is a whole lot of fun involved in this. You know me in puzzles. We've talked about this maybe once or twice. Uh, now we begin to see um, how these uh, various systems fit together, how they work together, and uh, how interconnected everything is. So without further ado, oh, with further ado, um, so I have some very crazy, crazy hair going on here. I just noticed that. And that's as good as it gets. Okay. So, um, just so you know, next week, yay, no homework. Right? Your homework for Chapter 79, done this week. Rock on you. So, now, let's get started with endocrine disorders. Whoop. Helps if I click the right button first. Come on. Current slide. There we are. Chapter 79, Endocrine Disorders. Uh, not an exceedingly, oh, let me move my face up out of the way here, it's going to get in the way. Um, not an exceedingly huge chapter, however, uh, very, very interesting. I want you to look at the interconnectedness, begin to think about, okay, how does this system affect everything else as we go through this? So first off, let's talk about endocrine disorders themselves. Well, the endocrine system, sorry, I got ahead of myself. The endocrine system regulates nearly all body processes. Um, so growth and development, uh, cardiac output, just about everything that goes on, uh, including uh, micturition and defecation, uh, has some endocrine involvement. The endocrine glands themselves are groups of cells that uh, secrete hormones. Um, these are messengers. Every hormone has a originating gland and a target tissue. Endocrine disorders themselves, uh, very simply, you have an overproduction or an underproduction of a specific hormone. That's it. It's that simple. Um, I, if I have hyperthyroidism, then I have an overproduction of uh, the thyroid hormones. If I have hypothyroidism, it's an underproduction of the thyroid hormones. If my thyroid is normal, no endocrine disorder. Go me. The major glands that we'll be dealing with. Let these populate here. So the anterior and posterior pituitary glands. Uh, the pituitary gland, uh, those two lobes, uh, referred to as the master gland. Many um, hormones released by the pituitary uh, affect other organs or other glands of the endocrine system, right? So anterior and posterior pituitary, the master gland. Just like everything else, everyone else that thinks they're in control, though, there is control for the pituitary from the hypothalamus. Um, we have the thyroid gland, uh, very important for metabolic rate. The parathyroids, uh, which are located, uh, there are four little groups, little glands about the size of a good sized grain of rice on the back of the thyroid gland on the posterior surface. Um, these four uh, glands uh, work uh, in concert with each other. Um, and then the adrenal gland um, is uh, separated 
here into two areas, the adrenal medulla or the middle of the adrenal gland, which releases fight or flight hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and the adrenal cortex, which releases the stress hormones, the corticosteroids. Okay. Both of these are in response to uh, two stresses. Uh, the adrenal medulla responds when the uh, stress is immediate and uh, life-threatening, fight or flight. Um, think, okay, here comes the bear. I have two choices because the bear wants to eat me. I can kill the bear and eat it, or I can run faster than the guy next to me to get away from the bear. Um, this is where the adrenal medulla kicks in, releasing epi or epi, and uh, allows me to either kill and eat the bear or outrun the guy next to me. The adrenal cortex responds to longer term stresses, like nursing school, um, releases the corticosteroids uh, to help the body manage longer term stresses and illness. Uh, the pancreas, it is a uh, gland of the, uh, it's an organ of the endocrine and exocrine systems. Uh, for the endocrine pur purposes, we are looking at the islet cells, the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. You have alpha cells, you have beta cells. Alpha cells release glucagon, which releases glucose stored as glycogen in liver and skeletal muscle. And you have insulin, which gets the glucose that has been released in or that is uh, resident in the bloodstream, gets them into cells so that uh, cells may carry on their, uh, their life processes. Remember from last term, uh, I began to introduce you to uh, an equation. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 equals 6CO2, 6H2O, and energy along with heat. And cellular respiration. This is uh, how the cells make energy. Uh, insulin gets the sugar inside the cell, gets the glucose inside the cell, so it may be burnt and uh, produce energy. Testes and ovaries, we're not going to go into this term. Uh, they are major glands of the uh, endocrine system, but you will be uh, working and looking more in depth into the testes and ovaries in nursing 303. Next term. Diagnostic tests for endocrine disorders. Well, first off, the pituitary, your anterior and your posterior. The tests that are done would be specific to the patient presentation. Um, some of the hormones released, uh, um, let's just look at growth hormone. If the patient is uh, of a really small stature, or conversely, of very large stature, or uh, is exhibiting signs of acromegaly, then we may see a, a test uh, for the amount of growth hormone being released. Uh, in thyroid conditions, one of the tests, the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, released by the pituitary. Uh, one of the things I, I, I do enjoy uh, about endocrine is some of those hormones actually make sense. Thyroid stimulating hormone released by the pituitary to stimulate the thyroid to produce its uh, Desire yeah, to produce its hormones. So, this is a case of uh, you have the originating gland, the pituitary, you have the hormone, TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, and then you have the target tissue, which is the thyroid itself. So, pituitary function tests, again, specific to uh, the patient's uh, presentation, um, what, their, what their chief complaint is, what their issue is. Thyroid function, we just got that one, right? Laboratory tests for thyroid function, and you will find a table in your textbook of basic nursing uh, in chapter 79, and that's table 79-2. Uh, it would be good to be familiar with these, uh, with these tests, as you may see these uh, uh, rather frequently if you are caring for patients who have thyroid issues. Um, Along with uh, this, you have imaging, uh, thyroid scan. Now, these uh, uh, 
radiation imaging. So uh, you've got the radio scan, CENTA scan, the radioactive iodine uptake. Uh, the thyroid requires iodine to produce its hormones, uh, T3 and T4. Without iodine, it cannot produce them. Um, and the radioactive iodine, this is not give you two heads and, uh, and cause your hair to fall out levels of radiation. This is a very low level of radiation that shows up in the scans so that we can see how fast the thyroid is utilizing the iodine. Then thyroid ultrasound, uh, one of my favorites for getting a real-time uh, uh, bedside look at, uh, at structures is uh, ultrasound. No ionizing radiation, no radiation dangers to the patient or to uh, the caregivers or family members. Um, and you can do the thyroid echo and look for uh, nodules, lumps, um, pockets. You get, a, uh, you get a picture of what it looks like. Parathyroids. Uh, so we... Uh, I already mentioned that the parathyroids for little glands on the back uh, surface or the posterior surface of the thyroid. Um, if you look at the thyroid, you will understand why I uh, sometimes refer to it as a meat butterfly. Um, because as it is located here, and if it were dissected out and uh, laid out flat, it would look sort of like a butterfly made of meat. Um, the parathyroids, uh, those four are on the anterior, or I'm sorry, on the posterior surfaces of that meat butterfly. Uh, parathyroids, uh, our major function is to uh, handle calcium. Um, it's uh, metabolism, it's use. Um, the laboratory tests uh, we would see is PTH or parathormone. Uh, PTH, parathormone, same thing. Uh, we would look at serum calcium, serum phosphate. Uh, a thing to remember that serum, that calcium and phosphate have an inverse relationship in both the serum and the bone. Meaning, let me come out of screen share for a second so that uh, this shows up better. Let me just enlarge my picture so this shows up better. <laughs> I love computers. Okay, so calcium and phosphate, uh, the inverse relationship. So in the serum, if the calcium is elevated, the phosphate will be decreased. If the phosphate becomes elevated, the calcium is decreased. That's the inverse relationship. One is high, the other will be low. Um, in, it's also inverse between the serum and bone, because bone is a great place to store calcium. Uh, that's besides its, our, besides its uh, job as uh, giving us structure, and so we don't just use around like a puddle. Uh, bone uh, stores calcium. If the serum calcium is high, the level of calcium in the bone will be decreased. If the serum calcium is decreased, the level of, there will be more calcium stored in the bone. That inverse relationship that I talked about uh, in the serum uh, in the serum between calcium and phosphate, same thing in the bone. If uh, if it's a high calcium content, the phosphate content will be low. And if the calcium is depleted from the bone, the phosphate content will be high. Let me shrink things up here again. Okay, that's kind of handy. All right. So uh, the serum alkaline phosphatase is another of the laboratory tests. Also, urine calcium. Uh, there are some things that shouldn't be spilling into the urine. Uh, glucose is one. Calcium is another that. Sorry, uh, that uh, shouldn't be spilling out in, uh, in uh, great quantities. 
and uh, a patient who has uh, hypercalcemia. Right? You may see an elevated urine calcium. This patient, uh, so if they're getting a lot of calcium in the bloodstream and they're getting a lot of calcium in the urine, what do you think that increases their risk for as far as kidneys go? I'll give you three, two, one. How about kidney stones, renal calculi? Um, the patients who have hypercalcemia run a higher risk for forming kidney stones. Parathyroids uh, may be seen on uh, with imaging studies as well, and we may do a fine needle biopsy. Another question for you, and you can drop this one into the comments. Why would we do a fine needle biopsy versus uh, another type of biopsy, uh, you know, using a larger needle or uh, cutting in and cutting out a section of a parathyroid gland? Adrenal function tests. Um, so lab tests, blood and urine, urine tests, imaging of the adrenal glands themselves, also your adrenal angiogram and venogram. Now, if you recall the last term where I started talking about a surgery is a surgery is a surgery, okay, in uh, many cases as well, an angio is an angio is an angio, the difference being is where it uh, is being done. So an adrenal angiogram, obviously, and the, it's there in the name, uh, would be uh, an angiogram of the adrenal glands, or a venogram, uh, adrenal venogram, would be looking at the veins um, from the adrenal glands. Um, with these angiograms, they're dye studies. Meaning that uh, you have, as, as with any other angiogram that you might do, it's using a radiopaque dye um, or a dye study uh, that you have some uh, common, uh, common concerns with angiograms, one of which is an allergy. Does the patient have an allergy to iodine? Okay, and I know we've just said that the thyroid requires iodine to work, so how can a patient have an allergy to iodine and still uh, and still have a working thyroid? Um, the answer to that is uh, seems to really be in the amount. Um, but uh, an allergy to iodine or an allergy to shellfish. So with an angiogram, wherever it might be, you need to be checking the patient's allergies uh, to ensure that they don't have an iodine or shellfish allergy. Shellfish. Just a hot minute here. Ah. Pancreas. You got to have a pancreas to uh, to survive. Uh, as you recall, you've got two hormones coming out of that um, that control blood sugar. Okay. General tests, uh, because remember that the pancreas is uh, an organ of the endocrine and exocrine systems. You have blood tests for amylase and lipase. Now recall that they are in A's, A-S-E. So ASEs are enzymes. These are the digestive enzymes that the pancreas produces uh, to be used in the GI tract. Test for diabetes mellitus. Now I want you to diabetes mellitus, M-E-L-L-I-T-U-S. This is where we are uh, specifically talking about blood sugar, okay, and its effects, right? Diabetes mellitus. Uh, random blood glucose, those finger sticks that uh, that we do as uh, nurses and caregivers, right? Our target is between 70 and 110 milligrams per deciliter. Below 70, patient is getting hypoglycemic. Above 110, 
patient is hyperglycemic. Hypo, hyper. Okay. So our target, and for uh, really great control for the diabetic, between 70 and 110 is where we want them to be. Uh, fasting plasma glucose, so it is fasting. I have not eaten anything for 12 hours. Um, no, you know, no more glucose brought in. Uh, if uh, the fasting plasma glucose is greater is greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter, twice, then uh, we are uh, looking at a patient who is most likely diabetic. Um, diabetes mellitus, or DM, uh, we have a couple of types that we will get into. Um, the oral glucose tolerance test, um, moms in the, uh, in the group uh, have probably experienced this, um, which is, uh, well, it's kind of in the name, it's seeing how well you tolerate uh, this uh, icky, thicky, yucky tasting uh, high glucose drink. The next piece here, the glycosylated hemoglobin. All right. This is what I love to refer to as the lie detector test. It's uh, my diabetic lie detector test. It's called the glycosylated hemoglobin A1C or an A1C or an HA1C or an HbA1C. They are all the same thing. Um, this is not diagnostic for diabetes. What it is diagnostic and indicative of is uh, how well the diabetes has been controlled. Um, glycosylated hemoglobin. So this is the glucose that is uh, stuck to the hemoglobin in the red blood cell, which lasts for how long? Put that one in the comments. How long does a red blood cell last? Um, so this tells me, okay, over the life of that red blood cell, how ha how well has the blood sugar been controlled? Uh, you may have a patient who comes in and is showing you their blood sugar logs uh, because they look really good. The highest they've been is 120 over the last couple of weeks. Beautiful, excellent. And then the hemoglobin A1C comes back as 13, and we know that uh, this beautiful, wonderful control over the last two weeks probably has not been uh, the case all the way through over the last couple of months, right? Estimated average glucose is another uh, that can come up with this looking at uh, diabetic control. The glycemic index for foods for planning meals to help uh, get the diabetes under control. And last piece, uh, urine tests, the keto diastics test, uh, looking for ketones in the urine and any spilled glucose. Uh, much like calcium, you shouldn't be spilling glucose into your urine. If you're spilling glucose into your urine, there's uh, kidney damage or your blood sugar is way too high. Um, and it can, in fact, make the urine sweet. Um, that was a 1.8 test for diabetes was tasting the urine. It's in the it's in medical history books, um, as frightening as that sounds. Um, uh, now ketones. Alright, so let's review C6, H12, O6 plus 6O2 equals 6 CO2, 6 H2O, and then energy with a heat. That is if the sugar is getting into the cell. If the patient is either not producing insulin or sufficient insulin to get the sugar into the cells, the cells will change their metabolic processes in order to keep functioning. But instead of producing CO2 and water, um, they produce a chemical cousin to acetone, the ketones, um, or you know, nail polish remover, produced in the cells because the sugar can't get in. Uh, 
um, this can lead to an acidotic state for the patient uh, because of the ketones or because of you know, the ketone production. So common med surge treatments for, <coughs> pardon me, common med surge treatments for endocrine disorders. So let's look, medical and surgical treatments. Surgical treatment for pituitary and thyroid, removing the gland, removing the pituitary, removing the thyroid. You have to remember this, that if you remove a gland from the endocrine system, the hormones that it produces will have to be replaced artificially you know, by receiving medication for the rest of that patient's life. So let's take a let's take a moment here where um, my patient has severe hyper 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 thyroidism, and uh, the treatment has uh, been decided that uh, the thyroid gland will be removed. Okay, great. Thyroid gland gland is removed. Patient is no longer hyperthyroid. Except that now, none of the T3 or T4 is being produced, and the patient becomes hypothyroid. And for that patient to remain, uh, to retain or regain, remain, retain, regain, yeah, uh, normal function, um, or a, a more normal uh, metabolic state, then the thyroid hormone will have to be taken for the rest of the patient's life. Um, but that would be levothyroxine is, uh, is the most common thyroid hormone replacement. So if you take the gland out, you fix the hyper condition, but now you've got a hypo condition to deal with. Diabetes mellitus, DM. Right? So cannot be successfully fixed with surgery. Doesn't mean that there are not surgical interventions, just you're not going to at this point where medical science is at, um, cannot be fixed with surgery. Um, I was actually surprised at the, uh, at the number of pancreas transplants that uh, are done in the U.S. in any given year. Obviously not so much going on right now. Um, but uh, it still does not necessarily fix the problem. A full pancreas transplant or transplanting pancreatic cells from a donor into, uh, into another patient. Why would that be? Why would that be that, uh, that it wouldn't fix the problem? Consider what happens in an organ transplant. It's great. It's wonderful, life is grand, uh, my pancreas is bad, I get a new pancreas from, uh, from some guy that missed a corner and hit a guardrail. Okay, but that pancreas does not belong to me. My immune system doesn't recognize it, so my immune system will attack it. Oh, well that's a bummer. Um, so I will have to take anti-rejection drugs. For as long as I want to live, uh, because the immune system does not get used to somebody else's organ being in your body. Okay? So if I am having to take anti-rejection drugs, these impact the immune system, because I have to tamp down my immune system, because that's what is uh, uh, that's what is attacking the transplanted organ. So if I tamp down the immune system. Um, then I run a higher risk of getting opportunistic infections. Um, there is a lot of stress on the body, and what happens uh, when the body uh, receives stress, a lot of stress, blood sugar goes up, because as part of the whole stress response thing, um, your body is saying, okay, I need more energy to get away from the bear or to deal with this long-term stressor, and it causes an increase in blood sugar. So, not yet do we have a real 
curative surgical treatment for diabetes mellitus. Um, I've mentioned two types of diabetes mellitus. There's type 1 and type 2. Type 1, uh, the pancreas is not producing any insulin whatsoever, and we will go into these further. Um, where type 2, the pancreas is producing what would normally be a, uh, a sufficient amount of insulin, but other factors such as insulin resistance um, are making it harder for the insulin to get the glucose in the cells. Of the two diagnoses, type 1, uh, which is uh, sometimes referred to as juvenile diabetes because, well, that was that it tends to be uh, younger patients where it's discovered in as they develop diabetic related issues. Type 2 it was and still is mostly in, um, in adults um, and you know, towards the 30s. However, this trend is changing. Now, type 2 diabetes. The most common diabetic um, diagnosis, type two, says a lot about our uh, our activity, energy, and nutritional levels in the developed world. Type two diabetes, we are finding younger and younger patients as uh, as childhood obesity becomes more of a common uh, more of a common thing. Um, Good news out of a uh, out of a research study here a while back uh, that the number of new diagnosed cases of childhood obesity uh, was actually declining. I do not recall which study that was. It was uh, reading the newspaper, uh, but it is actually declining in some areas as more. is more awareness to the problem comes up. Uh, but type 2 diabetes, uh, one of the major risk factors is being overweight. Uh, and that is where we're seeing it in the younger patients. They will, we'll dig deeper into this here in just a little bit. Um, diabetes mellitus, medical and surgical treatments, medical treatment, medications, right? insulin, um, oral anti-diabetic medications for type 2 diabetic patients and lifestyle modifications in many cases it is the lifestyle that has sort of got us into this mess to begin with um, so lifestyle modifications are a cornerstone of successful medical treatment for diabetes mellitus now let's look at pituitary gland disorders this is itchy today all right, so anterior lobe, um, gigantism or acromegaly. So I have here child and adult. Uh, we're talking about when the growth plates close. Um, so anterior lobe, overproduction of growth hormone uh, prior to the closure of the growth plates, growth hormone. Wondering what that does. Um, can cause uh, these children to be very, very tall, very, very large. Gigantism. Um, think, uh, what was the basketball player, Manute Bull? Um, very, very tall. Um, whereas acromegaly um, is the overproduction of growth hormone after the growth plates have closed. Those of you who are Princess Bride fans or uh, old uh, Raslin fans uh, may remember Andre the Giant. He was not actually a pituitary giant. He had acromegaly, which is what ended up killing him. A uh, famous American believed to have acromegaly uh, due to his uh, shape and size and who would likely have died um, at a fairly young age, had he not been assassinated. Any guesses? Three, two, one. Abraham Lincoln. So, gigantism, acromegaly, overproduction of growth hormone. Which one they have depends on when the overproduction happened. Posterior lobe. Here we have a couple. So disorders. Let's start at the bottom. A hypophysectomy. 
So we talked about the master gland, uh, you know, having its control center. Um, that would be the hypothesis. Right. Pituitary, so a hypothesectomy, by the way, removal of, right? Uh, pituitary neoplasms, tumors on the pituitary gland or in the pituitary gland which may affect uh, and cause overproduction of pituitary hormones um, and uh, may need to be removed. Right? Oh, there's a problem. Because if I remove the pituitary, I have to replace all those hormones. However, if I have a, uh, an overproduction of hormones from the pituitary, it causes other problems as well, right? Next one up. Remember uh, a slide ago. Diabetes mellitus. Right? This is diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus has nothing whatsoever to do with blood sugar control. I did not name them. I didn't do it. Don't blame me. I don't know why they decided to call both of them diabetes with a mellitus or insipidus. I was not alive at the time. Um, so, I just want you to know this would be a foot stomping moment if we were in class. Um, I don't do it here because it freaks the dog out. Um, and we don't need a hypercorgy trying to uh, uh, photobomb me here or video bomb me, whatever it is. Um, so diabetes insipidus is, uh, is an underproduction of antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone anti-diuretic so stops diuresis um, if I have sufficient levels of anti-diuretic hormone if I have the correct level then I am making urine at a fairly normal rate life is grand if I have diabetes insipidus I have an underproduction of anti-diuretic hormone which means that I'm not retaining fluids. Right? These patients say, uh, um, it's sort of like putting a funnel in the mouth and, uh, and pouring water in as it's coming out the other end. Um, so there's nothing to uh, slow down the diuresis. These patients can, uh, they're thirsty all the time, all the time. And uh, they dehydrate rather easily because there's nothing to stop uh, the, or nothing to slow down the urine output. Right? Uh, diabetes insipidus. The hormone is ADH, antidiuretic hormone, or vasopressin. Right? Those three are the same. Vasopressin is also a drug we use in codes to uh, bring blood pressures back up. Um, however, it's a uh, it needs to be used uh, early or not at all. Um, as uh, one of my instructors once said, uh, you know, you can use, uh, if you're going to use vasopressin, you use it early because if you drip a little vasopressin on a rock, the rock will come back to life. So the vasopressin will bring you back, but what are you bringing back? Um, SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Didn't name this one either. Um, SIADH is the flip side of diabetes insipidus. This is overproduction of vasopressin, which decreases the urine output and causes fluid retention. Um, these patients can be treated with diuretics and, uh, and they're okay, they won't dehydrate, but otherwise they will retain, uh, retain water, retain water and retain fluids. Um, they, will become hypertensive and eventually uh, are going to be dealing with a whole lot of edema. So SIADH and diabetes insipidus, flip sides of the same coin, and that coin is vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. SIADH, too much antidiuretic hormone, patient retains, retains fluid. Uh, diabetes insipidus, too little antidiuretic hormone, and the patient does not retain fluids and may dehydrate easily. Um, a point to note uh, with patient teaching for diabetes insipidus patients, they need to wear medical um, identification. 
uh, have a ready source of fluids with them when they are out and about. And if they run out of medication, it becomes a medical emergency uh, because if they run out of, uh, of vasopressin, then they're, uh, they will experience uh, the extreme diuresis and they will dehydrate quickly. So with the medical alert tag, the medical identification to alert first responders that this patient has diabetes insipidus um, gives them an idea as to where to start treatment. Thyroid. Woo! Okay, I started having fun with this. So we'll, uh, we'll start this out slow and easy. Hyperthyroidism. Overproduction of T4 and T3 um, increases the metabolic rate. Uh, we're talking Graves' disease or toxic diffuse goiter. In your yellow books, your textbook of basic nursing, there is uh, a picture of a patient with Graves' disease. And I truly honestly hope that she gets at least a penny for every time that picture is used. She may not be alive anymore, but. Uh, because that's been in uh, every textbook I have seen, we're talking about uh, Graves' disease. Um, you, she's thin, she's got uh, she's a little heavy right here in the neck, uh, and she looks really surprised. Um, symptoms are the symptoms, the uh, outward signs of Graves' disease. Um, or toxic diffuse goiter, uh, an enlarged thyroid that is overproducing T4 can have a toxic effect on the body as it burns you out. Consider the thyroid gland, uh, to make an analogy, consider the thyroid gland uh, like the throttle in your car, the gas pedal. Um, you're driving down uh, Interstate 5 at 65 miles an hour in high gear and your engine is burned, okay, at a normal normal range, right? That would be a U thyroid, U, U thyroid state, okay? With hyperthyroid, um, you are increasing everything, and that's like uh, stomping your foot down to the floor uh, while on that stretch of I-5, and everything speeds up. Metabolic, metabolically, everything speeds up, right? Hypothyroidism, well, let's see. All right, my animation got ahead of me, darn it. Because um, if hyperthyroidism is too much T4, uh, hypothyroidism, it uh, falls in too little T4. Right? For whatever uh, whatever the cause, um, recalling that if, you, if your um, pituitary has been removed, you're not releasing TSH, thyroid-stimulating hormone, which... Strangely enough, and the name tells you exactly what it does. It stimulates the thyroid to produce thyroid hormones. Um, if there's not enough TSH, the thyroid doesn't get stimulated to produce the T4, and you have a hypothyroid state. Uh, if the thyroid is damaged or not functioning correctly, you don't produce enough T4. And the effect is of either of these is a decrease in the metabolic rate. Um, now, most of you probably drive newer cars with fuel injection that uh, you never experience what it's like to drive an old car with a carburetor that the idle was uh, set too low and uh, it would build up carbon and gunk in the engine. Um, but uh, it's, it's everything slows down. Okay. Um, now, with this, consider if everything slows down. What is my patient going to be experiencing? Um, might they experience weight gain? Uh, might they begin to experience uh, symptoms of type 2 diabetes because they're developing type 2 diabetes um, because of the weight gain? Everything is slowed down. Uh, we're going to cover these a little more in depth here pretty quick. Um, and so that you have congenital hypothyroidism, uh, congenital, you know, so it's there at birth. Um, if not treated um, quickly, um, and that's a you know that's a state that's going to continue for the rest of your lives. But if not treated quickly, then this leads to growth and development issues. Why would we have delayed growth, delayed development, if 
metabolic rate was slow. Come on, somebody else on the monitor. Just the visual of that makes me go a bit. Okay, so consider that cells to reproduce, they have to have energy. You know, they have to make energy. And uh, for structures to be built, the cells have to be reproducing. And with that, um, you are looking at the metabolic rate. Uh, the metabolic rate is slowed down. Um, when they are so small and developing so rapidly, you're going to end up with the structures not developing as they should or as quickly as they should. And uh, therefore, you have your uh, your impairment of growth and development. Okay. Myxedema, Hashimoto's thy thyroiditis, uh, these are all uh, conditions uh, of hypothyroidism. Okay. Hyperthyroid. This is so much fun. So much fun. I had a little bit of fun building this one. So let's just start. Hyperthyroid. What is that condition? Overproduction of T3 and T4. Okay, hyper, overproduction. All right, so what is its effect? Remembering that thyroid affects the metabolic rate. Okay, so an overproduction would cause that metabolic rate to increase. So if my metabolic my one more time here. If my metabolic rate increases, then what is my condition next? Cardiovascularly, my heart rate and cardiac output will increase. They have to because of these demands on the body. Um, and now we're going to see the interconnectedness. Um, so before we go too much further here, so I've got CHO metabolism, CHO carbohydrates, O2 oxygen consumption, temperature, respiratory rate, and overall energy level. Okay, so overproduction T3, T4, its metabolic rate causing it to increase, which cardiovascularly causes the heart rate and cardiac output to increase. Well, why? Well, oxygen consumption goes up because, as you recall, C6H12O6 plus 6O2 equals 6CO2, 6H2O. So metabolic rate goes up, the demand for glucose goes up, okay? And with that increased demand for glucose, you have to have oxygen to burn it. Makes sense so far. Temperature goes up. Again, C6H12O6 plus 6O2 equals 6CO2, 6H2O, and energy. Um, some of that is heat. Okay, so my temperature goes up. Why would my heart rate go up? So, I mean, all right, so let's tie this all back to cardiovascular here. So first, O2 consumption goes up. Why would my heart rate go up? Why would my cardiac output need to go up? Um, because the tissues, the cells in the body, need a fresh supply of oxygen. And my heart rate, my heart, my cardiovascular system, is supplying those red blood cells, hopefully loaded with oxygen, to those cells to drop off some O2 and pick up some CO2 and uh, allow this uh, increased uh, metabolic rate to keep happening, all right? The increased temperature, heart rate, cardiac output uh, responding to that because your body's mechanisms to reduce temperature. Um, you think of blood. Blood's a wonderful, awesome thing, right? Carries all those nutrients, carries the oxygen. Um, it also helps to radiate, uh, to cool the body or help, um, help maintain thermoregulation. 
uh, one of the pieces of this is to bring that blood that has been soaking up the heat from the metabolic processes, get it near the surface of the skin to lose heat by irradiation, also get it through the lungs, not only to pick up more oxygen, drop off the CO2 so that you can breathe the CO2 out and make the plants happy, um, but also your lungs are much like big radiators. So that hot blood is, that hotter blood is moving through the lungs and uh, you are blowing off some of that heat um, as, uh, as you uh, breathe. Okay, from that hot blood that's going through there and it's cooling off and uh, some of the it's cooling off the blood as it's going through the lungs and lather, rinse, repeat um, until death. Okay. So I want you to think about now um, when you've taken care of a patient or a kid um, who has a fever. If my patient is febrile, two things I'm, I'm uh, going to not be surprised to see. Number one is flushing. Think about you know, when your kids get sick uh, and they get those little pinky red faces, uh, they start to flush a bit when they've got a fever. The capillaries uh, near the surface of the skin are dilating to get that hot blood close to the surface of the skin so you can lose heat by a radiant heat loss. Also, the respiratory rate increases. And that, again, is part uh, from thermoregulation to help blow off um, to get rid of some of that heat that's going through the lungs. Okay, Two pieces there for thermoregulation. So we've hit the overproduction of T3, T4. Hits the metabolic rate, causing it to increase. Cardiovascularly, heart rate and cardiac output increase uh, because we have a higher uh, oxygen consumption and uh, more heat being produced. Okay. Well, of course, obviously, if we're uh, increasing this metabolic rate and uh, we need more O2 to burn the uh, carbohydrates, our carbohydrate metabolism goes up. Okay, and so this is uh, using up as much um, as much of the uh, sugar in the blood as is possible. And um, hyperthyroid patients do not tend to be very heavy because they don't store much in the uh, form of adipose. Okay, so carbohydrate metabolism goes up, which increases the oxygen consumption, because right? you need the oxygen to burn the, uh, the carbohydrates, which uh, the burning of the carbohydrates uh, releases heat, which causes the temperature to go up. And oh yes, uh, cardiovascular uh, heart, um, the cardiac output and heart rate go up because not only do the cells need the oxygen, uh, but they also need the carbohydrates, um, which are delivered through the bloodstream. Woo, see, it's all interconnected. Well, what's that got to do with respiratory rate? Well, if my oxygen consumption goes up, my respiratory rate uh, needs to increase to supply more oxygen to the lungs to get into the bloodstream to be delivered to cells in the body so that they can burn the carbohydrates, okay? So oxygen consumption goes up, respiratory rate goes up. Body temperature goes up, respiratory rate comes up, okay? The last little piece here, energy level. Zing, it goes up. So what does this patient look like? Okay, so they're uh, going to be skinny uh, with uh, with hyperthyroid. Okay, um, they're probably going to be a little uh, red complected, right, from the flushing because of the excess heat. Okay, these patients also uh, the they're producing so much internal heat that. Um, this would be the person that you see walking down uh, Lancaster Drive in January in uh, nothing but a light T-shirt. Um, they have uh, they develop heat intolerance because they are producing so much heat themselves. Uh, thermoregulation becomes uh, sort of a problem, right? And uh, then you have the exophthalmos that, well, I can't get them to bug out as as far. Um, 
and uh, if you look at the pictures in the uh, in the nursing textbook uh, you can see all of these pieces in that one picture hypothyroid uh, well so we just had hyperthyroid with all of those pieces so for a second here put your nursing minds to work and think about what it's going to be what it's going to look like and first for hypothyroid um, if you said it's an underproduction of t3 and t4 you were right if you figured that the metabolic rate would go down again you were right huh wonder about uh, cardiac output and heart rate um, oxygen consumption well, that goes down too uh, temperature down again carbohydrate metabolism weird and the respiratory rate and finally what do you think happens to the energy level if you said it goes down you were correct um, so this uh, hyperthyroidism right everything was increased flip side of that coin hypothyroidism everything is decreased these patients uh, tend to be heavier with uh, with hypothyroid um, they all they're also um, the type that you, know, you, you may know uh, you may know people like this can't get warm even in the summertime because their metabolic rate is slowed their internal uh, heat production is decreased and of course energy levels are low carbohydrate metabolism goes down so they store the carbohydrates um, as adipose um, so these patients tend to be heavier and uh, this can lead to other comorbid conditions uh, if that uh, if that becomes serious enough oh there she is see she's kind of got a little flushing going on you know, rosy red cheeks here um, got that Nice big thyroid. She's otherwise, I mean, you, yeah, you can see those clavicles and everything. She's pretty skinny. And uh, she has the exophthalmos. She looks very, very, very surprised. This is the one. Um, I don't know who she is, where she is, when this was even taken, but I am hoping that, like I said, that she gets at least a penny because she's in every textbook I've seen when you're talking about hyperthyroid. So, continuing, simple goiter, uh, an enlarged thyroid. Um, little known fact today that goiter used to be endemic to the central United States. Um, in the population of the century, goiter was not uncommon uh, with that enlarged thyroid. What changed this? What, you know, when was this? Uh, so, this was before refrigeration and uh, high-speed transport uh, patients living near the coast both uh, both coasts didn't uh, really develop goiter the reason being is near the coast um, even in root crops uh, plus you've got uh, um, the seafood availability and this is ocean seafood, not freshwater. Seafood availability, more iodine in their diets. When you got to the center of the U.S., those uh, that produce uh, that seafood did not make it that far in because it wouldn't survive the trip. And this is where you would see people with goiter. Then comes salt okay sodium chloride what's that got to do with goiter 
sodium chloride doesn't have anything to do with goiter. But if you grab your table salt and you look at it, um, you may see, unless you're uh, you know using some of that uh, yuppie salt that's uh, you know just salt itself, iodized salt, uh, and that has iodine added to the salt to provide iodine in the diet that wouldn't be there normally. Cool little bit of history. Thyroid neoplasms, thyroid tumors, um, which may result in a thyroidectomy. Now, when you got a thyroidectomy, um, well, I mean, so a surgery is a surgery is a surgery. Uh, so you've got the usual the hemorrhage and inflammation and yada, 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 right? Uh, those five. But you also have now the location, okay? And uh, the gland is working on. So first, let's look at a total thyroidectomy. All right, total thyroidectomy, remove the whole thyroid. It's sort of there in the name. Uh, subtotal, removing part of the thyroid, okay? Uh, it can lead to some Interesting post-operative complications. Um, so, tetany, Schwastex and Trousseau signs are in your book there. Um, caused by hypocalcemia. But wait, we just, we didn't, we just took the thyroid out. What's that got to do with calcium? Uh, recall the location of your parathyroid glands. If they are not uh, saved or relocated, then the parathyroid glands, uh, those hormones would also need to be um, replaced. And so you have uh, potential for hypocalcemia in the serum, right? Post-operative complications. Thyroid crisis, thyrotoxicosis, or thyroid storm. Um, now, this, this is scary. This is a medical emergency. This can kill you. Uh, Consider, if you will, back to the analogy of driving down I-5, um, and you're in drive, and and you're rolling along at 55. Uh, now, same stretch of I-5, same car, um, same speed, 55 miles an hour. Downshift into first gear and drive at 55 miles an hour. Well, no, don't do that because you'll break your car. Uh, but this is uh, this is the analogy there, um, where you have this overproduction that has just blasted the uh, the metabolic rate. I mean, it's just it's screaming high, burning, burning up. Um, now, would this use your uh, critical thinking for a moment? So, would this be a complication of a subtotal thyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy? This thyroid thyroid crisis or thyroid storm. Okay, what's your answer? Um, if you said that it would be with a total thyroidectomy, then you were wrong um, because there's no thyroid tissue there to produce T3, T4. However, a subtotal, um, this is a uh, potential uh, post-operative complication. Uh, consider now you have, uh, you have tissue that produces, uh, that produces T3 and T4, okay, or T4, you know, this is and you have just cut into this and severely irritated that tissue. Um, the irritation of that tissue can cause uh, the uh, elevated production of T4 because the cells are irritable and they're cranky and they're just doing their thing and push the patient into a severely hyperthyroid state. Okay. Now, the last piece. Bleeding and airway obstruction. Remember, a surgery is a surgery is a surgery. Okay, you got bleeding there, but think about where it's at. How would we get the airway obstruction? Right here. So, what is a common surgical complication of any surgery? Let's see, we got bleeding, we covered that. We got pain. Okay. Uh, See hemorrhage, pain. Oh, 
there's a, some that I'm thinking of or some that I'm forgetting. Potential for infection, right? Okay, potential for infection. Bleeding, pain, potential for infection. What's number four? What is number four? For infection. Number four. Anesthesia complications. And then our last one, big old thumbs up or thumbs down in this case, inflammation. So done neck surgery, or I've had a neck surgery, and the tissues are irritable. I've got bleeding, of course, I've got some big pipes that deliver blood going through here. All right, that can be a that can be an issue for bleeding. Um, but also I have inflammation of the tissues surrounding the site of the insult or the site of the surgery, which happens to be surrounding my airway. So with these patients uh, who have had uh, this neck surgery, very careful monitoring of their respiratory status and an endotracheal tube or an ET tube, um, an artificial airway ready at the bedside because if this patient begins to lose their airway, they're going to lose it pretty fast. And then following that, the patient uh, will uh, possibly end up in the OR for the placement of a tracheostomy um, because of the, uh, the swelling of the airway and the airway obstruction. Right. <clears throat> okay, that's a little weird. I just punched the wrong button there. Um, okay, that's there's a whole lot of odd going on here. Okay, for a moment. Let's pull this down and let me see if I can figure out what it is I just did. Okay, figured it out. All right, let's go back to uh, share screen again. Oh, I love buttons. Back up to current slide. I said, All right, parathyroid gland disorders. Here we go. Hyperparathyroid, an excess of PTH or parathormone. Blood calcium levels rise, calcium depletion in the bones. Right. Hypoparathyroidism, deficiency of PTH. It's almost like it's in the name there, isn't it? Uh, from lower production of hormone, reduction in the amount of calcium available to the body, and an accumulation of phosphorus in the blood. Adrenal gland disorders, Cushing syndrome, hyperadrenalism. Okay, so in this case, we are talking about the adrenal cortex. Um, so we have potential for hypokalemia, hypernatremia, and hyperglycemia. Uh, the corticosteroids release cause you to retain sodium, uh, thereby retaining water. Um, the uh, the rule of water follows salt, okay, or in this case, sodium. Um, hyperglycemia, uh, remember these are stress hormones, okay, and hypokalemia, hypokalemia resulting from the uh, dilution of bloodstream from all the retained fluid. Cushingoid appearance, I want you to anchor this in your mind, okay, moon face, round, heavy face. Um, due to uh, fluid retention, a heavy abdomen, and thin extremities. Uh, if I were to uh, draw an analogy, uh, take an apple, uh, put two toothpicks uh, in the bottom and two toothpicks coming out the side, and you would have the heavy abdomen and the very thin extremities. And the last is the, uh, uh, what they call the buffalo hump, which is a uh, fat pad 
between the shoulder blades uh, on the back. Um, so this is Cushingoid appearance. Um, I will bet that if you think about it, the last time you went to the store or were people watching, of course, that was before uh, the coronavirus, hopefully, hopefully you're social distancing and staying at home. Um, then uh, you have seen these patients walking around. Um, and uh, I mean, the key is uh, Cushing's versus uh, obesity is you will have the thin extremities versus heavier extremities uh, on a patient who is obese. Addison's disease, right? Destruction or degeneration of the adrenal cortex or the lack of ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, produced where? Um, okay, so this is another one that has a uh, ACTH, has a, uh, a gland that produces it, the pituitary, uh, has the hormone ACTH, and has a target tissue, the adrenal cortex. Um, this hormone is released and triggers the adrenal cortex to produce corticosteroids. Okay. So it could be uh, that the adrenal cortex is damaged or is just uh, otherwise non-functional or that the pituitary is not producing ACTH. So if the pituitary has been removed, uh, not only do we need to uh, replace TSH, but ACTH, so that their associated glands will continue to function. Right. See, so it's bronze skin. Um, uh, bronzing color to the skin, uh, especially in creases, weight loss, thinning hair, and in this case, stress may lead to adrenal shock. Okay, in uh, in severe cases uh, of Addison's. Okay, so stress may lead to adrenal shock. Do we remember what shock is? Shock is the decrease in blood pressure, precipitous drop in blood pressure, uh, brought on because uh, the uh, body's reaction to stress and it's not retaining fluids to keep the pressure up, um, so the blood pressure drops. Um, Addisonian crisis is just exactly what it sounds like. It's a critically low adrenal function. Okay? Not just a low adrenal function, but now we're in crisis, uh, critically low. Primary aldosteronism. So here we had hyperadrenalism, hypoadrenalism. Okay. Primary aldosteronism, so the production of aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone released that uh, causes the causes you to retain sodium, and by retaining sodium, thereby retaining water. So hypertension is uh, is one piece of this because you have more fluid trying to be packed into the tubes, and then hypokalemia because the um, the bloodstream is being diluted with the excess fluids on board. Um, and this can also lead to muscle weakness uh, due to the dilution. Adrenal neoplasms. Um, so the one we're going to talk about here is my favorite word to say um, today, anyway. Pheochromocytoma is a tumor of the adrenal medulla. Now, it's generally a benign tumor, but as we have discussed before, just because it's benign, meaning non-malignant, not cancerous, uh, does not mean that it cannot cause uh, some significant issues. Right? So here we have a tumor in the adrenal medulla, the pheochromocytoma. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are produced in the adrenal medulla. This tumor uh, can incorporate those uh, those epinephrine and norepinephrine producing cells, leading to a very high level of adrenal uh, adrenaline, epinephrine, epi, epi and norepi production. Um, this can cause extreme hypertension, tremor, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and increased urine output. 
So let's uh, break a couple of these down. Extreme hypertension. Okay. So think about what happens when you get startled. Now this is generally in class where I begin to talk really, really, really quietly and, and I do something loud and crazy that startles everybody. Um, you get to miss out on that. That's, I find that unfortunate. Um, that's a little bit of an adrenaline boost. With the pheochromocytoma, that increased secretion can uh, can really be amplified. So your blood pressure comes up as part of the fight or flight response because all of your organs and muscles, uh, your body is making sure they're well perfused so that uh, you can attack and eat the bear or run away from it or outrun the guy next to you anyway. Um, tremor, get shaky, nervous. Okay. Increased urine output, that one I want to want to go into because I want you to think about how this would work. Okay, so let's say we have a couple of kidneys because most of us do. Um, we have a heart that's a pump and we have some great big pipes coming off that pump that's delivering blood um, called the aorta. The aorta comes off the top of the heart and it uh, comes down through and smaller arteries branch off of the aorta until it branches into the left and right uh, common iliacs and uh, then into the femoral arteries and goes down to the lower legs. The organ, uh, a couple of the organs that uh, tap right off of the aorta uh, where they're getting good blood flow are the kidneys. Now this is very important because that blood flow is going through the kidneys and that is where it's getting rid of wastes and uh, dumping off a little extra water, right? Making urine. If I increase the cardiac output, so I'm increasing the blood flow through the kidneys, would that increase or decrease my urine output? If you said it would increase my urine output with a normally functioning kidney, you would be correct. So consider that the last time you were startled or scared, what happened to your heart rate? It ramped up uh, due to the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Your cardiac output increased. This, in turn, increased blood flow to the kidneys, causing increased urine output or diuresis. Um, I would like to tap back a couple of slides to hyperthyroidism. Okay, that would be another piece that with hyperthyroid, you, your patient's urine output would be increased over the hypothyroid patient because of the increase in cardiac output. Make sense? Ah, oh, to the pancreas, pancreatic endocrine disorders. So we really won't be uh, focusing on amylase and lipase, right? That's because that's the exocrine function. Pancreatic diabetes mellitus, type 1, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, IDDM, or what we call juvenile diabetes. Then we have type 2, which is non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, or NIDDM, or adult-onset diabetes. These names uh, um, don't be confused. Uh, type 2 still may use insulin, but a type 2 diabetic is still producing insulin, um, just not in sufficient quantity. Um, and it may be a normal quantity, but the patient has developed insulin resistance, and therefore uh, it's required more insulin to get the glucose into the cells for normal function. All right. Type 1 diabetic, the pancreas is not producing insulin. Those beta cells are not producing. Um, type 2, those beta cells are producing just insufficient quantities for what the body requires. Right. Type 1, type 2. Gestational diabetes. Um, this comes on uh, with the stresses of pregnancy. And in our last bit, although uh, much like prehypertension, this is one that is 
causes uh, falling out of use as well is pre-diabetes, um, which may be you know impaired uh, IgH, IFG, or impaired glucose tolerance, IgT. Uh, so pre-diabetes, and this is uh, you're beginning to show the warning signs uh, with your blood sugars. Um, generally, you're looking at pre-diabetes that would be pre-type two, um, and the time to treat that is in the pre-diabetes stage because once you're a type 2 you are always a type 2 but Sean my aunt Margaret was a type 2 diabetic she was on all these medications and she changed her diet she exercised and she got her weight under control and and now she doesn't take any medications she's still a type 2 diabetic she is just controlled with lifestyle modifications once a type 2, always a type 2. One word, diabetes. Throw that in there. It's just fun for me. Anybody not know who this is? So let's look at a compare and contrast of type 1 and type 2. All right, so the age of onset. Type 1, generally under 30 years of age. This does not mean that someone over 30 could not develop type 1 diabetes if there was damage to their pancreas. If the pancreas is no longer producing insulin, then you are a type 1 diabetic. Uh, but generally, type 1 uh, diagnosed under age 30. Um, type 2, we tend to, to see more over the age of 30, but as you recall from, uh, from previous discussion here, we are seeing younger patients becoming type 2 diabetics. The classic symptoms of diabetes in type 1 diabetes nearly always present. In type 2 diabetes, usually not present. So, what are the classic symptoms? We call them the three P's polyuria, polydipsia, Polyphagia, P H A G I A. So, polyuria, uh, urinates a lot. Polydipsia, drinks a lot. Think uh, going in, uh, and dipping into the bucket to get a cup of water. Okay. Um, so, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, hungry. All right, now let's, uh, let's look at the inner. Um, so eating a lot right now you generally uh, are triggered to eat when you're hungry because your blood sugar is starting to get low right but my patient has a blood sugar of 500 why is he still hungry okay so here's how uh, here's how this little bit interlinks um, so my patient has type 1 diabetes, polyuria, they're urinating a lot, uh, bloodstream is becoming more concentrated due to the high levels of glucose, which is uh, causing the patient to urinate, okay, to try to get this out, um, which is causing some dehydration for the patient. Uh, blood sugar is still high, but they're losing water, so it makes them thirsty because your thirst centers are triggered to make you drink. Okay. At the same time this is going on, still has the hunger because while the patient has ample blood sugar, and you know, we're talking type 1s here, um, so the patient has ample blood sugar, the glucose is not getting into the cells. And they are still sending their signals that, hey, feed me, feed me, feed me which causes the overall organism, us, um, to be hungry and to eat, which then further concentrates the bloodstream with all of that glucose that's being, uh, that's being absorbed and then causes the patient to be thirsty because their bloodstream is, uh, is concentrated, uh, so they're feeling dehydrated and they drink more and then they produce more urine and all of this is going on while the sugar, while the cells are still not getting glucose. 
Um, so it can be this, uh, this kind of nasty cycle that's going on constantly. That's on a type 1 diabetic. That's pretty easy to spot. Type 2 diabetes, uh, I call it sneaky diabetes, um, because type 2 diabetes, these classic symptoms are usually not present because even in a type 2 diabetic, some glucose is still getting into that cell. Not sufficient amounts, the blood sugar is still high, but some is still getting in there. So you generally do not see the three Ps in a type 2 diabetic. Um, type 2 uh, is, is a really, really, really sneaky beast. Um, I was doing some reading a while back. The World Health Organization, uh, this is three years ago now, I think it was, uh, released a study about diabetes. And uh, the number of cases diagnosed worldwide of diabetes had increased fourfold in the time of the study, which I, or the time of the review, which I believe is about uh, 15 to 20 years. Fourfold increase. The majority of those were type 2 diabetics. And you want to guess where in the world those increases were coming in the developed world. Go on a rant about big F and small F foods and uh, uh, big F foods. That's the fresh, uh, you know, fresh veggies uh, and uh, unprocessed uh, pieces. And small F foods are those that are cheaper and because they're more stable and last longer on the shelf and they have all the processing with them. With that, there tends to be a high amount of sugars leading to um, a growing trend in obesity. No pun intended. Um, so with obesity comes an increased risk, as you see this uh, down here on the page, uh, for type 2 diabetics, they are usually overweight. Okay. Um, so we have all of this building. It's in the developed world with all of these processed and yummy foods that uh, we're really seeing the increase in type 2 diabetics. Now, as far as worldwide, access to health care increases uh, your uh, chance of being diagnosed as a diabetic, not because access to health care will give you diabetes, Bob, uh, but that uh, you are seeing a health care professional and getting diagnosed. Um, with uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, and especially in patients that do not have primary care physicians, don't have primary care coverage, don't see their physicians regularly, they are often diagnosed with type 2 um, when they are admitted to a healthcare facility or seeing a physician for something else. Ever come to this hospital again? I came in with a broken leg and you guys gave me diabetes. No, Bob, you had the diabetes before. We just found it. All right. So, the uh, one of the figures in the uh, in the article that I was reading is that by 2050, if trends in the U.S. continue as they are, or as they were at the snapshot of that, if trends continue as they have been. In the United States, one in four people would be diagnosed as a diabetic. Uh, 90, 95% of all of the uh, new diagnosed cases of diabetes are type 2 diabetes. 95%. That says a lot, folks, on how we live. And I'm telling this to nursing students who uh, used to have uh, really busy lives and now they're sitting and studying all the time in quarantine at home during the COVID outbreak. Um, watch what you're eating um, and don't study snack. Those not good study snacks. Um, potato chips. So hereditary factors. For type 1 diabetes, 
uh, well, diabetes does tend to run in families. It may not run in families the way you quite think. Type 1 diabetes, uh, hereditary factors, meaning that uh, there are other type 1 diabetics uh, in direct line are occasionally present. Type 2 diabetes, usually present. Um, where to take with this is if you have a first degree relative, like mom or dad, okay, a first degree relative who is a type 2 diabetic, your chances for developing type 2 diabetes just skyrocketed. Um, now, much of this, uh, there's much debate nature versus nurture and, uh, and how this uh, would all play out. Uh, but uh, often it is uh, family eating habits, uh, the types of foods, and genetic disposition uh, to how uh, different organisms uh, or different people handle um, the uh, higher glucose, uh, high fat foods that uh, are so readily available. All right, weight. Uh, type 1s uh, tend to be normal or underweight, whether where type 2s are usually overweight. Ketoacidosis. Okay, let's pull back to that uh, cellular respiration. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 equals 6CO2, 6H2O, energy and heat. Yeah. All right. In the case of a type 1, um, now here it says not susceptible. Type 2s, uh, severe type 2s can get ketoacidosis. It's just really pretty rare. They have a different condition. So susceptible to ketoacidosis. Now we talked about uh, if the glucose can't get into the cells to be burned, if none of it can, then they will change their metabolism. They will burn other uh, other sources and produce ketones, which build up in the bloodstream and uh, can cause acidosis and acidotic state. Uh, so a pH uh, out of the range uh, of normal. Um, so with pH that we're going to cover in week six for chapter 17, um, that we run slightly alkaline, so at the pH of 7.35 to 7.45, um, ketoacidosis can bring that pH down to the uh, to the sevens. Um, if it gets lower than seven, um, it's a very, very scary situation uh, because tissues will begin to break down and systems stop functioning. So in general, uh, type 1's susceptible to ketoacidosis. Type 2's, not as much because some glucose is getting into the cells. Um, some of that cellular, normal cellular respiration is happening. Now in severe type 2, um, the patient could develop ketoacidosis, uh, but generally the ketones are cleared to, uh, um, quickly enough that they don't develop ketoacidosis. Usual treatments, huh? Insulin for a type one diabetic um, because they are not producing any insulin whatsoever. Meal planning and exercise. Well, meal planning and exercise. These are those lifestyle modifications uh, that we've already talked about uh, to help the patient manage their blood sugar so that they do not get hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic. Uh, now note type two, meal planning, exercise, right there at the top, um, oral medications, and or insulin may be added to help control these more severe cases of type two diabetes. The type two diabetic with changes to lifestyle uh, may be able to get themselves off the insulin and the oral medications. The type 1 diabetic will be on insulin for life. Right? Now you note there's no oral medications listed here for the type 1 diabetic. <coughs> 
So this brings me to a story. I wish I could independently verify it. Um, this came from a nursing website that I was a part of years ago. And uh, we're talking about um, crazy patient situations. Um, as I said, I cannot independently verify this, so I cannot say it was actually a thing. Um, but here's the story. Multiple reasons I, I tell this. Um, so the patient uh, was admitted through the emergency department um, in HHNS. Or no, sorry, it was admitted in DKA. That's right. Diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, the patient uh, went to the floor, was treated for a few days, uh, newly diagnosed as a diabetic, um, and uh, was taught insulin administration and the lifestyle changes and everything. All was grand, all the paperwork was done, the teaching had been done, the patient went home. And uh, as they had uh, instructed this patient on how to do the injections, they gave the patient syringes and saline and an orange to practice their injection technique. Injection technique. <clears throat> great. Demonstrate a perfect return demonstration. It was all great. The patient goes home. Two weeks later, is readmitted to the hospital again in diabetic ketoacidosis, readmitted to the floor. Bob, we'll call the patient Bob. I don't know what the patient's name was. Bob, were you not able to get your insulin? No, I, I got my insulin. Well, were you injecting it? Were you checking your blood sugars? Yes, I did everything just like you showed me. Um, do you have your insulin with you? Yeah, I'm here, here it is right here. Can you show me how you were doing the injection? Okay, I can do that, but I need an orange. Wish I could independently verify this. What I know of people, and uh, if it uh, can go sideways, uh, it will. Um, there was a piece of patient education and return demonstration that was obviously missing in the first part. The piece of patient education was that you have to actually inject yourself uh, with this medication because insulin cannot be absorbed through the GI tract. The acid will break it down and it's no longer functional. Um, so, you know, there's that piece. Patient education, so very important with these. Making sure that, hey, your patient can in fact, and knows in fact that they have to inject themselves. They can't say, uh, they can't inject something else and then eat it. Um, and then, of course, with the orange, uh, not only were they not was the patient not getting uh, the insulin because it was breaking down the GI tract, but was also getting a dose of fruit sugar. Um, so, I wish I could independently verify that one because uh, it's a beautiful story and illustrates uh, the importance of patient teaching and proper patient teaching perfectly. So let's look at insulins. What is the goal of insulin therapy? Dang it, I beat myself to the punch again. To mimic the body's natural levels of insulin. Now, this is our goal of insulin therapy. Um, we can come awful close. Remember that the pancreas is there, it is resident, it is responding to, uh, to triggers, um, it is, and it is producing insulin and glucagon uh, as needed, uh, and we don't even know that it's working. We know when it's not working, but we don't know that it's working. So we have, in order to try to mimic the body's natural levels of insulin, we have these different types. So you've got an ultra-rapid, short-acting insulin. Then you've got a rapid, short-acting insulin. All right, these are the regulars. All right. And then we have the NPH insulin. This is an intermediate action. And then the long-acting insulins. Um, so guidance here. Uh, when you are checking a patient's blood sugar and you have an order you know, before meals and, in, and at HS, know the type of insulin that you're giving for this. But you also want to be sure that if you are giving the insulin, that the food is ready. 
um, ultra rapid uh, short acting insulin can uh, start start that climb up and peak within 15 minutes to a half an hour okay um, for myself I don't really feel comfortable giving this until I see the fork on the way to the patient's mouth um, definitely uh, the tray needs to be in the room and set up in front of the patient um, <clears throat> for the rapid acting uh, not the ultra rapid uh, again um, that tray needs to be in the room ready for the patient to eat uh, because this too has a very uh, quick to a peak right? and when insulin is at its peak it is knocking the blood sugar I mean, it's getting blood sugar into the cells and it's working really fast um, where we've talked about hyperglycemia blood sugar being too high the flip side of that coin hypoglycemia if given the choice, if given the choice, if I had absolutely had to choose as to uh, what blood sugar my patient had, and I had a choice of 20 or 200, um, I would take the patient. Uh, you know, I would say, okay, patient, have a blood sugar of 200 because then I have more time to treat you. Um, whereas a blood sugar of 20 is getting me very close to that range of not compatible with life. If we give these uh, these fast acting insulins and then the patient doesn't eat, um, or the tray is delayed, say the uh, wheel falls off the uh, the tray cart uh, as it's coming from the kitchen, and all those trays are dumped, and it's now another hour. Um, I need to make sure that my patient is getting something uh, in the way of food to avoid their blood sugar crashing and them going hypoglycemic. NPH is an intermediate, uh, much longer acting. It has a slower curve to its peak, and it has a longer duration of action. So where my camera is mirrored, so on. so if we have a an ultra rapid, it starts here and it goes up, and then drops off fast. A rapid acting starts here and it comes up and then drops off a little slower. NPH starts here and then it comes up and then it drops off. Okay. These are all used uh, so that they have their peaks at different times or helping to maintain a steady blood sugar and close to the body's natural levels of insulin. Um, the last piece on here is our long-acting insulins, uh, and these would be like Atlantis, um, this is the brand name, uh, insulin uh, glargine, G-L-A-R-G-I-N-E, um, which provides a, uh, a low, long-acting, about uh, 24 hours worth um, dose or level of insulin to help maintain blood sugars at a more normal level. So it comes up. So it comes up about so and then, and then tapers off over that extended period of time. Um, often these will all be used um, together in one patient to try to meet the goal of insulin therapy, which is mimicking the body's natural levels of insulin. Patient teaching for insulin. Very, very important. Like I say, the orange. Okay. Teach the use of insulin, its care, and its storage. Um, where is it kept? How long can it uh, be kept that way after opening? How uh, is it drawn up? How much? All of these pieces have to be taught to the patient or the patient's caregiver. Um, and you have to assess as you're doing that, is this patient going to be capable of managing their own insulin therapy? If you have concerns, you definitely need to report those to the clinician caring for that patient. Right? Insulin coverage and insulin pumps. So insulin coverage, uh, insulin coverage, insulin therapy is and should be, is or should be, 
um, individualized to the patient because none of us are exactly alike, right? None of us. We are all different. We all re react a little differently to our surroundings. Uh, we're, we are just different beasts. And with that also, reactions uh, to medications are different. So each of, these, uh, each of these patients should have individualized insulin coverage. Um, the last piece with insulin pumps, <clears throat> um, well, this is, uh, again, we're trying to mimic the uh, goal of insulin therapy. And what an insulin pump can do is provide a steady trickle of insulin to help uh, mimic that natural level. Uh, the trick is, is that uh, this pump doesn't actually care. It's doing its job. It's a pump. It's a machine. It is providing that steady trickle. So if there are changes to the patient's condition, say the patient gets sick or the patient is unable to eat, the blood sugars won't be controlled as they would with a fully functioning pancreas. And scarily enough, uh, with some of these insulin pumps now, there's an app for that, uh, where the pump can be managed through a smartphone app, which is just a little terrifying to me. All right, other meds and treatments. Simlin helps improve average glucose levels. Right? So your hemoglobin A1C or your EAG cannot be combined with insulin. That doesn't mean the patient cannot receive it. That means that it cannot be combined in the same syringe as another insulin. Okay. Oral diabetic medications. These uh, have their, uh, well, as with any medication we give, there's always a potential for a side effect. Um, there is always the potential for an unintended effect. And many of the same pieces that come in with insulin therapy also apply to oral antidiabetics. Meaning if you are taking your oral antidiabetics and you decide that you're not going to eat that day, or you get sick and don't feel like eating, uh, then the blood sugar is going to react accordingly. If you're not bringing anything in, but you're still taking the oral antidiabetics, blood sugar may have a tendency to drop. Or if the patient gets sick or under stress, um, their blood sugars may rise because that happens uh, to patients under stress. Um, one thing to tie a couple of systems together here. So we've been talking about diabetics, um, but here just, uh, just a while ago, we were talking about corticosteroids, which are often given to treat inflammatory issues, uh, respiratory especially. So when your patient who is a diabetic and is well managed, their blood sugars are awesome, receives corticosteroids, will likely see their blood sugars increase. Um, they will go hyperglycemic because uh, they're reacting to the stress hormones that have just been administered IV or orally. Pancreas transplant, we've already really discussed that. So some complications of diabetes. Why are we spending so much time on diabetes when there's all these glands? because it is such a common and increasing uh, diagnosis in our patients, especially in our older patients. So hypo and hyperglycemia. Okay? Um, you really want to become familiar with the signs and symptoms of both hypo and hyperglycemia. You wanna be able to tell the difference uh, because the treatments for uh, for each are, well, they're opposite ends of the coin, right? Just like the hypo and hyperglycemia are opposite opposite ends of the coin, opposite sides of the coin, just as uh, hypo and hyperglycemia are opposite sides of that coin. Di diabetic ketoacidosis, we've discussed this. Um, 
BKA, type one uh, generally. NNHS, which used to be called NNHKS, but then they decided to remove the K. Um, so hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic syndrome or non-ketotic state, all right? Um, HHNS. This is what type 2 diabetics get, generally. Um, and uh, much of the difference is that they're not producing ketones, they're not acidotic, uh, but the bloodstream is really concentrated because the blood sugars are so high. Uh, poor wound healing with diabetics. So if I'm thinking here, all right, I've got poor wound healing. What does that place my patient at a higher risk for? Yeah, yeah. Poor wound healing, higher risk for infections. A higher risk for surgical complications. Um, not only uh, not only the complications of the surgery itself, but of recovery. Because if we've done a surgery, what have we created? If you said we've created a wound you're on the right track. So surgical complications increased. Uh, higher risk for uh, death related to surgery. Macrovascular complications. So these are the big vessels, okay? Big vessels. Macrovascular and microvascular, right? Microvascular, macro big, micro small. All right, so let's think about macrovascular complications, so big vessels. Um, not necessarily the aorta, but let's think of coronary arteries, cerebral arteries, um, the uh, renal arteries, right? All of these blood flow to these organs. Okay, so cerebral arteries, the brain, right, requires two things to run. It needs oxygen. It needs glucose. Uh, if they, if those can't be delivered, then, well, it's not going to run. If the arteries supplying the brain get clogged up with, uh, oh, how would they get clogged up? Um, another complication of diabetes is what's called lipodystrophy. So fat and cholesterols are packed in weird places. In the case of macrovascular complications, um, you know, in the larger vessels, it tend to cause fatty plaques to build up in the supply lines. So fatty plaques building up in the supply line to the brain, blood flow is impaired, um, you have a higher risk for blockage and then stroke. Another macrovascular complication, uh, let's look at uh, the coronary arteries. Same thing, the fatty plaques build up. They cause that. So we have an artery that's normally this size, but now I've got a fatty plaque that builds up that blocks off a bunch of that artery. Now it's much smaller, and a random clot or piece uh, of another fatty plaque that breaks off comes through, plugs it up, then we have what's called an MI, a myocardial infarction, or a heart attack, right? Um, impairing blood flow to the kidneys, same way. Right? Decrease blood flow, kidneys don't function as well. Not only do they not function as well, they uh, are not perfused as well, and uh, more damage to the kidneys results. With the macrovascular complications, a patient with diabetes, has the same cardiovascular risk as a patient who has already diagnosed cardiovascular disease. Right? That's pretty rough. Um, these are the macrovascular complications. Let's look at microvascular complications. So micro small vessels, nephropathy. So these are uh, the arterioles that are feeding the structures of the kidney, such as the glomeruli. They get plugged up for the same reason, lipodystrophy. They get plugged up 
and you lose more and more real estate for filtration and end up with kidney damage, kidney disease, um, or kidney failure eventually. Uh, very common for a uh, dialysis patient to have already been a diabetic. Um, diabetes can damage them, damage them, those kidneys, and those kidneys, as we talked about first term, really pretty important. You don't get on well without them. Retinopathy. Um, so the small vessels in the eyes, feeding the structures of the eyes, the structures don't get fed, they quit working, they die, blindness happens. So can't see, can't be. And neuropathy, can't, can't feel the feet. Um, that is one of the places uh, with, and again, with the uh, with lipodystrophy, it begins having effects on these structures, and neuropathy starts, lose sensation, or that sensation is replaced by others. Um, there are uh, medical therapies to treat neuropathy, however, with these, the macrovascular complications, the microvascular complications, and the neuropathy. Um, Let's look at uh, what would be the absolute best treatment for these conditions. Three, two, one. If you said prevention, don't get the disease in the first place, then you are right on top of it. You are going to make an excellent nurse. Prevention of these complications by prevention of diabetes okay now it may not be uh, may not be a thing that is possible in all cases so with the microvascular and complications you've got can't pee can't see and with neuropathy can't feel the feet um, and if you really need to get Bob's attention so that he will start uh, so that he will start paying attention to the uh, the teaching that you're giving him and hopefully get his blood sugars under control, you can say, yes, it can also cause uh, sexual dysfunction. Whatever gets their attention. So let's look here. I'm going to move my big head again. All right. Hyper and hypoglycemia. All right. So let's look at the differences, shall we? <coughs> Hyperglycemia, drowsy. These uh, these would be your signs and symptoms. Drowsy. To unconscious, that's really drowsy. Right? This is hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, super high blood sugar. Fruity breath. Um, if you have uh, smelled nail polish remover, it does tend to have a little bit of a sweet scent to it. Fruity breath uh, is telling me that there's ketones built up. Thirsty. I know part of it uh, with the thirst uh, is because they are becoming dehydrated. Okay. Weakness. Tachycardia. Again, with the dehydration uh, drop in, uh, in blood volume due to the dehydration drop in fluid volume. Uh, heart is going to respond by increasing cardiac output to perfuse the organs. Tachypnea. All right. Now, remember when I said that uh, C6H12O6 plus 6O2 equals 6CO2, 6H2O. Okay. You've heard this maybe once or twice. So cellular respiration. Byproducts, CO2 and water. Yes, you're making water as you sit there. Now, CO2, when dissolved in water, becomes carbonic acid. Acidosis, all right, so here's a... So one of the ways that we help maintain our acid-base balance uh, that your body does without you noticing is through respiration. Since CO2 equals acid, the faster I breathe, the more CO2 I'm blowing off, reducing uh, reducing the amount of acid uh, potential in my bloodstream. Okay. 
thereby increasing the pH. Um, so this is a this is a mechanism to help maintain acid base balance. And uh, if I am becoming uh, acidotic due to diabetic ketoacidosis, heart rate's going to go up and respiratory rate's going to go up. The heart rate's going to go up again, not only just uh, not only just because of the uh, dehydration, but also to get more of those red blood cells through the lungs to drop off their CO2 and pick up some O2 and then blow that CO2 off as we exhale and make the trees happy. Vomiting, right, with hyperglycemia this is due to the CNS effects, CNS, central nervous system. Uh, the CNS effects of acidosis and a concentrated uh, bloodstream. Flushed and dry skin. Okay. So this is a picture of someone with high blood sugar. Drowsy, unconscious, fruity breath. Drowsy, maybe unconscious. Fruity breath, weak, uh, flushed and dry. Uh, one piece here is with the CNS effects of, uh, of acidosis is it can make them a little goofy too. Um, it is important to uh, to teach your diabetic patients that um, they probably should wear Medic Alert because it may make the difference between a uh, trip to the drunk tank and dead or a trip to the hospital and survive. Um, let me give you a let me give you a picture here. So you're at the mall, hanging out at the mall. I don't know if people still do that or not. Um, it was never really my thing, but you're at the food court and you're going to hit a Cinnabon. Um, and you see this guy over in the corner and he's slumped over the table and he looks kind of rough. And he's mumbling to himself and he just can't get his hair on. Oh, great. One of them. Time to call the cops, cart him off to the drunk tank. Um, and uh, as you approach the table to see if he's all right, because of course you're a nurse, and even though you may think, oh yeah, he's just drunk, you're going to go check it out. And uh, you see he's got a little gold bracelet on with a red star. And you flip that over and you see diabetic. Now you slap yourself a little silly for assuming that it was just some dude who was drunk in the middle of the day. Um, and instead of uh, calling 911 for the police, you call 911 for the ambulance because uh, here's a diabetic who is uh, very obviously having issues with his blood sugar. Right? Hypoglycemia. Let's look at the difference here. So some confusion. Right? Because your brain runs on two things. You gotta have glucose and you gotta have oxygen. If you're hypoglycemic, you don't have the glucose. And that can cause some confusion. Brain doesn't have the fuel it needs to run. A headache as it's coming on. Drowsiness. Again, you know, this is all uh, getting fuel to the fuel to the brain. Nervous. Huh. Does any of this sound like hangry? Because in a way, yes, that's uh, that's what we're looking at here. So nervous, right. weakness again, okay. Cold, skin's cold. Uh, body is uh, shunting blood uh, to the core organs, uh, not so much for the oxygen, uh, but to supply those core organs to try to protect those core organs. Right? So we've got, we got some cold, you know, a little cool, maybe a little clammy. Hungry. Weird. I don't have enough blood sugar. Why would I, uh, why would I be hungry? Uh, because my body's trying to replenish that blood sugar. Shaking. Tremor. Okay. CNS effects. Uh, the body is well out of balance. Diaphoretic. So getting sweaty. And a late sign. Now, this is a late sign of either. Okay, let me, let me bring that up again because I had fun with this. Um, a very late sign of hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia would be death. That is a very late sign. If you got to this point, you missed something else, um, 
as it led up to this. Okay, so late sign, death. Okay. Um, become very familiar with uh, with these. Um, you will see them in your patients. And you want to avoid Okay, that's not. All right, let's compare and contrast HHNS and DKA now. HHNS, type 2 diabetic. DKA, type 1 diabetic. In general. HHNS, blood sugar over 600 milligrams per deciliter. That's a high blood sugar. DKA can start in at 250. Now, depending on where you're working and what uh, and what equipment you have, with HHNS at over 600, the meter may just greet you. You put the blood sample in and it says hi. I'm like, hi meter, can you tell me what the blood sugar is? And it says hi. Okay, can you tell me that hi? Um, when it is saying hi. It's not greeting you, it's telling you there are bad things happening for this patient. That blood sugar is above what the meter will read. All right, DKA can start in at uh, greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter. I have seen it, uh, I have seen type 1 patients with higher blood sugars than that that, uh, that had not gotten acidotic yet. But in general, uh, DKA starts at a much lower threshold than HHNS. HHNS can cause severe dehydration uh, because there is so much sugar, so much glucose, greater than 600 milligrams per deciliter. That's a lot of glucose. Um, so relatively dehydrated because the uh, fluid volume has not uh, changed substantially. DKA can cause severe dehydration through fluid loss. Uh, from uh, from the ketoacidosis. Right? HHNS, not acidotic. DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, it's in the name. HHNS can lead to coma. So can DKA. Treatment for HHNS. Fluid. Electrolytes and IV insulin. Huh, wonder what the treatment for DKA is. Different processes, but the uh, but similar treatments here. Fluids and electrolytes <coughs> to uh, correct the uh, to correct the dehydration, uh, provide some dilution. IV insulin to get the blood sugar into the cells. <clears throat> now, one thing to be aware of is due to the nature of the pumps that move things into the cells, the sodium potassium pump. If your patient in HHNS or in DKA, if their uh, potassium level is normal, um, when you give the IV insulin, May cause their potassium level to drop, so you've got to be uh, really monitoring that, monitoring for signs and symptoms of hypokalemia, and looking at the lab results uh, because the pump. Uh, so I got sodium here, and I got potassium here, and I've got a glucose molecule coming in on this side, and some insulin and. Uh, I get the insulin and they flip places. Well, I've just moved all that potassium into the cell. Serum potassium drops, um, which can uh, which can cause some issues. Now, here's a uh, little tick for you. Treatment for hyperkalemia, high potassium, right? And high potassium can be life threatening. It can cause a flat line that your that your patient will never recover from. Uh, when you think about it, uh, or if you know the final stage in lethal injections for uh, um, for 
condemned prisoners, the final stage is potassium chloride. Uh, it interrupts uh, the electrical balance and causes the heart to stop. Treatment for hyperkalemia is IV dextrose and IV insulin. Loads up the sugar into the bloodstream and then slams that potassium into the cell with the uh, with or with the insulin. Cool, right? Saw it work. It was awesome. It was as awesome for the patient coming in, but hey, she turned out great afterwards. Late sign again. HHNS and DKA. Yep. That's a that's a late effect. Okay, I had fun making some of these assuming. All right, long-term management of diabetes mellitus. Hold on. Long-term management of diabetes. Um, no, by the way, this is not polydipsia. This is uh, caffeine addiction. Um, plan teaching. Weird. That's right on the top. It's almost like that's something we do as nurses. Yeah, we do a lot of patient teaching as nurses. Okay. Right on the top. Maintaining physician contact. So making sure that your patients are going to their regularly scheduled visits. Um, finding ways uh, that they can make it to those visits. One way in which we found uh, through a little bit of uh, research in acute care in making sure that our patients made their follow-up appointments, made it to their follow-up appointments, when they would discharge, the patient comes in with, uh, with coronary artery disease, has an angiogram, gets a stent placed, doctor on discharge says, okay, I need to see him in two weeks. So previously would say, okay, Dr. G wants to see you in two weeks in his office. The patients never made the follow-up appointments because now they're feeling better. They got a little wire stent in their heart, slamming the artery open, so no more chest pain. And they never made the follow-up appointments. What we found is if we made the next appointment for them, or you know, if we made that first appointment for them, then most of the time it was more effort for them to reschedule the appointment than it was to just actually show up and the patients would show up to the appointments. Otherwise, they keep putting off making the appointments. <clears throat> it's also why you may notice when you see your primary care physician um, going into the clinic that they bring you right by that reception desk going into the back, and then on your way out, they snag you to schedule your follow-up appointment. Same basic idea. They catch you there. They get you to commit to the appointment, and then you see your physician again, unless you're me. Um, so physician contact, glucose monitoring. Okay, that's a... Monitoring the glucose. Now, whether this is a patient who is a, who is a type two diabetic that is super well controlled on uh, on lifestyle modifications, diet and exercise, or if it's a uh, type one diabetic uh, on an insulin pump, um, you've got the glucose monitoring that needs to happen. And generally, who does that? The patient does that. So we teach them how to monitor their own glucose. Um, the patient cannot handle it. We teach their caregiver, their primary caregiver, how to monitor glucose. <coughs> um, we may refer them to nutritionist for meal planning, um, which is uh, covered by most insurances right, for meal planning for treatment of diabetes uh, because, hey, meal planning is part of those lifestyle modifications. Uh, taking care of the lifestyle factors, uh, energy, well, not energy level, activity level being uh, heavy among them. Then smoking. Remember what I said uh, here just a little bit ago about a patient with diabetes has the same cardiovascular risks as a patient who is already diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. 
smoking increases the blood pressure and increases those risks. Right? And finally, teaching them how to do insulin injection, or now when we say alternative forms of insulin administration, we're talking pumps here, okay? Or having someone inject for you. Uh, but again, this is uh, all teaching on how they're gonna do it, how they're gonna get their supplies, um, which may require the assistance of a medical social worker in some cases. Uh, this is definitely a case where you have the whole care team working on this patient. Because if possible, you would like to not see them again in any sort of an acute um, an acute setting, right? Much rather see them in the primary care setting, having things adjusted, than in an acute care setting uh, where they are uh, coming in with a complication, right? Got to teach them how to manage hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, right? Because these and uh, even in the really coherent cognizant patient, we still want to teach their significant other, their family, their primary caregivers, their whoever is uh, in close with them, how to manage hypo and hyperglycemia. Because as you recall, there's some confusion, drowsiness, and consciousness that goes that, that can go along with both of those conditions. And if the patient is out of it, they won't be able to manage their own condition. So it's not this in this case. It's not just teaching the patient, but it's teaching the uh, caregiver as well. Um, teaching about sexuality um, and the effects that diabetes may have on that. What about exposure to cold? What do you think? Cold exposure has to do with lipodystrophy and has to do with neuropathy. It also has to do with uh, lipodystrophy and uh, the body's reaction to cold where vessels will clamp down to avoid heat loss. Um, but in the case of neuropathy, Exposure to cold can be uh, can be dangerous for these patients because they may not notice that uh, their feet are now frozen. Um, higher risk of uh, of unknowingly developing uh, frostbite or cold related injuries, just as uh, higher risk of developing uh, wounds on the feet or uh, or infections, uh, infected wounds, because they don't feel the the insult, the wound itself. Vision impairment uh, with the microvascular complications uh, and a lot of patient safety around that. Dental examination, foot care. Foot care and uh, foot inspection. <coughs> Normally, at this point, I am standing on the table in the front of the classroom telling you to check the feet. So you're just going to have to visualize that one because my camera doesn't uh, really pivot that well. But check the feet. Uh, if your patient is a diabetic and they come in, check the feet. If you think your patient might be a diabetic when they come in, check the feet. If you think your patient might possibly know a diabetic, check the feet. Um, if you are riding on the bus in the summertime and someone sits down next to you wearing flip-flops, check their feet, right? Feet are the furthest away from the brain. Um, and this is where wounds tend to hide. This is also where infections tend to start. Um, a uh, patient care scenario was, uh, was a uh, fellow that came in. Um, he came into the ED with a, uh, with a blood sugar over, well, no, no. His blood sugar was uh, was about uh, four something. That wasn't even the scary part. Critical care, blood sugar, four something, meh, amateur. Uh, but his white count, his white blood cell count was over 40,000. Okay. And they were mature white blood cells. This patient had an infection. 
uh, when we received reports, I, I had a brand new grad with me. It was her second night on the floor. Um, and so uh, we got reports that this patient was coming up. Um, infection of unknown origin, white count of 40,000, uh, hyperglycemic type 2 diabetic. Okay. So I told my new grad <clears throat> to go get the room ready and get him tucked in when he arrived. I was uh, actually uh, in another room working with Dan at that point, uh, taking pictures of a patient's backside who came in with some pressure-related injuries. I had just told the, uh, told the patient to uh, crack a smile um, and take the pictures when my new grad walks in and says, so he's in, he's tucked in, uh, got a look at him, he has a wound on his foot. Very matter of fact. Um, and I said, okay, well, I'll uh, bring the camera in there, I'll be right in. Finished taking the pictures, uh, got him uploaded, went in to greet the patient. Um, and here's a fella sitting in the bed, and he's got his uh, shoes and socks on and his boxer shorts and a gown. Um, and uh, so I says, okay, so I, and we'll, we'll call him, we'll call him Joe, because he's not really a Bob, he's more of a Joe. Um, I said, so uh, Joe, I hear, uh, hear you've got a wound on your foot. He says, yeah, I was just hoping that if I ignored it, it would go away. Oh, red flag. Um, so I said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to need to look at it and get some pictures. Um, so he takes his shoe and his sock off of his, foot and I am actually glad that he was looking at the foot when he did that because it gave me a, a chance to actually get my poker face back on because I'm pretty sure my jaw hit the floor. He didn't just have a wound on his foot. Uh, his foot was almost completely girdled with dead tissue. Um, it turns out he had had this uh, wound going for about three months and just wasn't telling anybody about it. And he's still walking around on this foot. Uh, most of this foot is dead. There was a thin strip of tissue running uh, across the top of his uh, the top of his foot, where you find the pedal pulse normally, to his big toe. Thin strip of skin, and it was translucent purple. Um, and it was otherwise, it was almost completely encircling his foot. Um, now tell this story for two things. One, okay, if you ignore the wound, or, you know, a couple of reasons I should say. If you ignore the wound, it's not going to go away. Um, two, uh, this patient had gone through not only the emergency department where he was seen by an ED tech, an ED nurse, and an ED physician, but also through an admissions unit where he was seen by a PN and a CNA in the admissions unit and came all the way up to the critical care floor uh, still with this infection of unknown origin. It took a brand new graduate nurse to take a type 2 diabetic with a very high uh, white blood cell count with an obvious infection to actually look at the patient's foot. There was a big stumble. Someone at some point in the ED, knowing this patient is a type 2 diabetic, should have looked at the feet. So check the feet. Um, because when the patient left the hospital a week later, he was a foot shorter on one side. Um, actually, he ended up with a below-the-knee amputation, uh, about uh, an inch below the knee, because uh, they had to the infection had gotten into the bone, caused osteomyelitis, and they had to keep cutting until they found viable uh, viable tissue. Um, and this is uh, this is a thing. So check the feet. I'm not going to stand on the desk because it'll collapse underneath me. But check the feet with your diabetic or potential diabetic or hell any patient. Quite honestly, look at the feet. Traveling. So making sure your patient understands when they're traveling, uh, you know, they need to have, uh, they can't check the insulin in through, uh, in their checked baggage because uh, it may end up in Albuquerque and they're in New York City, right? The insulin's got to come with you. You also need to know how to 
you know, how and where to get the insulin, making sure you got the doctor's names, making sure you got your current prescription. Because traveling, if you're insulin dependent, you still got to get the insulin. Right? And then, I mean, syringes can go in the checked bag because you can get syringes at the pharmacy. Uh, but the insulin may be a little trickier to get a hold of. Last piece is identification. Identification as a diabetic just for, uh, well, I mean, think of the example that I gave you of the guy in the uh, food court at the mall. Um, if, uh, if a nurse had not walked up uh, and checked on him, um, he might have ended up in, the, uh, in jail in the drunk tank sobering up when he wasn't drunk. Make sense? And that, my lovelies, I do apologize for the delay. I've uh, spent a bit of time getting you guys all squared away here. Hold on. Ah, there we go. Back to, yeah, I know that's it's a little scary. Um, so wave bye-bye to Hello Kitty and, and all the stuffies there. Uh, I'm not sure where I'll be recording from uh, next week, but, uh, well, you don't have another lecture line next week. And you don't have uh, you don't have homework next week. Whatever shall you do? Oh, get ready to study for the midterm, which uh, we'll be sending out uh, some study guides for. Uh, with that, enjoy, and I'm now going to fire this puppy up and upload it to YouTube.